Roberts and Roberts Brokerage and Libertopia are pleased to present Manhood More Vital Than Politics by Ken Royce, also known as Boston Tea Party, author of 13 books and the founder of freestatewyoming.org. Who else would you have to write on something that's important for Generation Next to come in and learn modules of manhood? That's one thing that we're missing, and, I, and I'm glad that you know Boston's here to talk about it because it's something that I think, as we take on the responsibility of raising our own children, that there are things that we should know and understand and think of the importance that he's taken the time with his skills to make available to us. Modules for Manhood by Kenneth Royce, my friend, Boston Tea Party. <laughs> I'm tethered to the stage here, cool. Only tether I allow in life, huh? First time at uh, Libertopia, very happy to be here. I've spoken at a few other liberty-oriented groups, um, such as Freedom Summit, uh, Liberty Forum in Nashua, Doug Casey's Eris Society. Anybody ever been to an Eris Society? Had those until the uh, late 90s. And so uh, these things are always different, always funky, unique, and the flavor is, is always something memorable to take home. So I've enjoyed coming to uh, California, especially by small airplane. And uh, that's been an adventure, landing at uh, San Diego at night in a small plane. So uh, it's, been a, it's been a very interesting and fun trip. And I'm very honored to, be, to have been asked to uh, speak about a new book and a new direction, a departure from you know, where I've been. And I think a lot of the subjects that I've been passionate about and have written about can come together, oddly enough, in a sort of a remedial self-help book for men. It started out for young men, but you know, the more I got into it, the more I started learning stuff, learning modules that I needed to complete, stuff that was uh, uh, lacking in myself. So instead of modules for manhood, what every man under 21 must know, and it became man under 25, then 30, then 45, then I just scrapped the age you know, requirement whatsoever and just what every man must know. Because I think every uh, man can get something out of this, and it's not just for men, but it is male-oriented, manhood-oriented, um, issues of masculinity and, and so forth. However, it's still a, you know, a human condition kind of uh, subject, especially the first volume. Um, it's gonna be three volumes. The other two are uh, pretty much complete, but as you all know, the hardest part is finishing you know, something. You can get 95% there, and the, the other 5% seems to take as long as the previous uh, 95%. I'll give you kind of an overview of how I, how I got here. Why, why, why am I writing about uh, this sort of thing? Um, I have to uh, congratulate uh, the folks that are here because it's only a small and cherished few that have come to realize through education and passion in their minds and bones that not aggressing on their fellow man is really the way to live. And it's equally a small group that understand the wisdom of free markets and how to distribute the uh, resources of mankind. Now, if all of mankind would honor these two principles and stick by them, the world would become unrecognizably better and a long uh, way towards libertopia. However, it is with no conflict to these excellent political and uh, economic philosophies that I've somewhat moved on. Reflective of our libertarian, libertopian theme, I've never been content with merely writing or talking about liberty. Freedom and liberty are not mere abstractions I'm waiting for or longing to enjoy. They are the context and mindset with which I make real life everyday choices. Uh, it's what my life I try to make look, looks like outside my front door every day. I've moved on to providing pointers and giving others a jump start and the means of building themselves into excellent human beings, myself included, as a work in progress. The kind of people who tend to create the freedom and liberty they want and are about to use. Now, an excellent man demands liberty. An average man doesn't even care for the liberty he already has. They sit around playing games with plot lines of immortality while living a life not worth dying for. Part of what led me on this path is something that is becoming increasingly recognized by most of you here, that one can be a wonderful and inspiring human being or a complete and utter scoundrel while still remaining completely within the bounds of libertarianism and the non-aggression principle. 
And getting at that is uh, what I'm trying to uh, attack with my book. The NAP is good as far as it goes, but it's, it's a great interpersonal philosophy, but it's not a complete intrapersonal you know, philosophy or dogma. There's still elements inside human life that uh, non-aggression principles aren't really going to reach. You know, questions of style, morality, preference, purpose, wisdom, communication, laziness, patience, pride, integrity, character, decisions, work, health, gentlemanly behavior, husbanding, fatherhood, suffering and living. These preferences and decisions present a man with a wide latitude of choice, strategy and tactics, completely outside the realm of what libertarianism can help him decide. A young man cannot, start, cannot stop at reading Rothbard, von Mises, Hazlitt, and expect the areas I've listed to fill themselves in as if by some sort of libertarian osmosis. And yet these areas make the character of the man and shape the arc of his life. The NAP and the free markets do not, in and of themselves, make for strong, patient, courageous gentlemen of honor who can defend themselves, their families, and their communities against aggression. So how does a man make the right decision when faced with a sea of unknowns and where there are no external or visible threats but for the squandering of his own life? Um, you know, we, we hear a lot about uh, owning yourself, owning your life, owning your body, the fruits of your labor, and so forth. And that makes perfect sense in the four dimensions that we are very comfortable with and that, that are familiar to us as socks on our feet space and time, basically. But as probably some of you know, mathematicians and physicists have postulated with pretty good solid inference that there are at least 10, if not 11, dimensions, especially in the superstring uh, uh, theory. So, okay, we own ourselves in the four, all right? What about the other six or seven? What's going on on there? Do we really own ourselves in, in, in that metaphysical, you know, weird space? You know, are we living in an ANCAP world or trying to make an ANCAP world in the four dimensions, but living under a tyranny or a uh, monarchy, you know, in all 10 or 11, you know, depending on your views of the creator or how, how we got here. Uh, life is a strange thing. And, you know, it could be a holographic uh, projection, as many uh, movies have suggested, like The Matrix and so forth. Uh, physicists are trying to, like, get to a point where they can prove that, you know, whether or not we are living in a, in a holographic uh, context. It's called holographic simulation. You can look it up in several sources. You know, if, if you're living in the cube, like in the Star Trek, when they put, uh, what was the name of that character? Uh, they put, yeah, put him in, in the little cube and he can like, spin his little evil guts out forever. You know, could he prove he was in the cube, you know, and try to find a way out of the cube? Uh, we don't know, but we're start to, starting to think about these things. But my point is, the NAP and libertarianism and owning your own body and, and making your own decisions and owning your life, uh, perhaps that really only is relevant uh, within the four dimensions. And we don't know what kind of construct we're under and what kind of constraints we're under, what kind of duties we may have in the other. Not to get mystical on you, you know, and metaphysical and all that, but life is a tricky, strange thing. So I think it's important to not focus so much on politics and philosophy at the expense of things that politics and philosophy don't easily get to inside the human core. And I can touch on some of these things. It's, it's, it's like describing you know, something by inference. And after enough of this, perhaps you know, we can kind of get a handle on it. But I'll give you uh, the chapter list of the first volume of um, Modules for Manhood. And you can see where I'm going with this. As I said, it's three volumes, and it's sort of sequential in the building blocks, I think, that are necessary for a quality human being to help develop himself. And it's kind of like you know, trying to build a 10-story building without having first built the foundation or the first floor and all that. And you're, you're, you're excited about building the penthouse suite when you've got nothing else underneath it. I think we need to start from the ground up on a lot of stuff. So volume, uh, chapter one in volume one would be understanding, just like... As Phil says, you either get it, Dr. Phil, you either get it or you don't, right? There's a lot of things in life that you just sort of have to, you have to get first because if you don't, you're going to operate with a, a very odd context of misunderstanding. And, you know, a lot of the stuff is about you. A lot of the stuff is about people, how the world works, money, and so forth. So, you know, garbage in, garbage out, uh, trusting your gut, 
We're spiritual beings having a physical experience. I mean, that's worth a book in itself. Whatever you think about, you will do. Whatever you do, you will become. You know, be very careful about what goes in your mind because it's going to percolate there and turn into action somewhere. Uh, you run your day or your day runs you. Uh, Eyes and ears versus one mouth, it's a four to one input output ratio. So I think it's good to uh, be quiet and just listen and uh, hear more. Worry never solve, solves anything. Accomplishment is what creates happiness. You know, these are vignettes and uh, they're, they're related, but it's likely not about you. That's, that's a tough one to learn. Oh, here's a, here's a good one. Um, all ambiguous behavior is interpreted negatively. Just because our egos think, well, it's about us. You know, they didn't call back. Did I piss them off? Are they mad at me? Or they, you know, did I offend them or something like that? You know, they just lost their phone for half a day. No, it's not about you. Uh, mind your own business. The height of maturity is taking responsibility for yourself. I read a lot of self-help books um, just to mine uh, good nuggets in there. And the main thing that any good self-help book will say is you've got to accept responsibility for your actions. Uh, this is key. It goes back through every culture. The samurai made practically a religion of it. They had something interesting to say. They said, when you say a thing, you own that thing. There's no need to promise to show up on Saturday. I said I would show up on Saturday. I've created that action in a future universe, and I will be there Saturday. A, a samurai doesn't promise. You know, I will be there, and that's the end of it, period. So... Responsibility is the flip side of freedom, and I think that's probably the main reason most people don't want freedom, is because they sense, if not know, that if they're free, if they have liberty, the other side of that is the responsibility. And I don't think we have a sheep society or slave society. I think we have a childish society where the average populace, regardless of their age, emotionally is about, I don't know, 14, 15 years old, and they still want to live under daddy's roof with the cell phones and, you know, food and all that. Uh, they've got their own car. Uh, they have some restrictions, and they chafe at those, but they can live with that. But they don't want to grow up. Most people, I think, at least in this country, just do not want to grow up. And so they're going to resist the responsibility that is concomitant with a free, productive, own-my-own-life human being. And I think this is the main resistance to libertarianism, uh, the NAP and so forth, is you know, they just want to stay a 16-year-old with all the goodies at home, because it's good enough. Um, I'll make another metaphor uh, about that. People say, uh, you know, the, the Mexican uh, immigrants, the undocumented uh, workers or whatever what you want to call them, they come here to be free. You know, they're, they're a ripe, fertile source of uh, becoming converts in the libertarian sense. Uh, I'm not so sure about that because leaving Mexico doesn't mean you want to become free because you came to the United States. It just means you want to become freer than you were when you were still in Mexico, right? Just because they came here doesn't mean it's some sort of litmus test for uh, libertarian soil. They, they, and they get here and they're satisfied with the increased freedoms that they have, but they're not going to take it that much further in a libertarian, uh, anarcho-capitalist, stateless kind of sense. So I think they're in good company with, uh, with the average American who just wants to remain uh, a kept man, a kept woman. Because as, as you know, you don't run your own business, live your own life. Uh, it's tough. It's day in and day out being responsible for everything you do. And you know, why would they want that? It's like the movie uh, Wag the Dog. Well, why are they at war with us? Well, they, they want our freedoms. Why, why do they want freedoms? You know, why, why, why would they want liberty? I'm not convinced that uh, folks do. So understanding is the first chapter. Second chapter, and I'll go through this real quickly. Thinking, truth, and wisdom. Uh, chapter three, integrity and character. Chapter four is a, is a big one. Conquering, conquering your fear, depression, laziness, anger, impatience, and pride. Um, wow. I think probably most of those probably re would resolve to pride. You know, if you look at impatience, how dare they make me wait, you know? Fear is a sense of pride. I mean, I think is the bottom of fear is pride. You, you have a right to be fearful of that. Your, your, your silly phobia is, is, is greater than, you know, whatever the phobia is about. Laziness, certainly that would be pride. You know, how dare they wake me up early in the morning to, uh, <laughs> so I have to be responsible. Depression, that's a tough one. That's probably related to a lot of other things. Maybe anger. 
But anyway, I've, I'm not a psychologist uh, by any means, but I've, I think I've got some ideas on conquering some of these bugaboos that get in the way of all of us. Chapter five, individuality, courage, and manhood. That's probably in this book the, the most manly uh, related of the chapters. Chapter six, uh, getting along better with people. I learned a lot about that as a thinker and an introvert and someone uh, who grew up without siblings and you know a few cousins and all that. So I've had to learn a lot through my life about being with people and considering other people and uh, you know getting out of the me mode and into the we mode. Uh, communication. Chapter seven, persuading. All of us are selling something every minute of the day. I'm selling something, you know, my sincerity, my knowledge, uh, blah, blah, blah. You're selling your attention, you know, and so forth here. We're all trying to persuade each other of something. And uh, I'm not a salesman. My marketing of my books and my publishing is the weakest aspect of my business because I'm just not a salesman. And I don't like to be sold to, but we still need to know how to persuade. And uh, that, that comes in handy with uh, haggling, bargaining, trading, and stuff like that. So I've got some great tips on persuading. Three more chapters, uh, selling and then learning and training. Learning and training is a good chapter. Um, not necessary to go to college for every you know, young person, and probably advantageous if you don't. At least think outside that box. Think outside the automatic you know, 100K in student debt that you're going to get for a degree that's not very marketable. Um, it's an interesting age coming. People are really interested only in what you can do for them, all right? People are selfish. People are self-motivated, self-energized, and it's like, you know, what can you do for me? So the way to make money is, I mean, every dollar I've ever received in my life came from another person, right? And how did I get that? Exchange of perceived value. How do I get more money? increase my perceived value to my market. And there's many ways to do this. A great book called What Color Is Your Parachute? It's about a young person going to college and trying to figure out his career path and therefore his degree path. Uh, not that I recommend going to college, as I said, automatically. But something interesting out of that book is they break down what everyone does in life is really related to three sort of areas. You either work with people, you either work with information, or you work with things, sometimes a combination. Um, a salesman, or I'll put it, a massage therapist, definitely a people-oriented industry, right? Information, um, computer programmer, things, car mechanic. There can be an overlap in that, but generally people fall into one of those th three things, and what color is your parachute helps you uh, get to the bottom of where you are in those, those three. Okay, what kind of people would you like to work with? Old people, young people, alive people, dead people. Some people work with dead people. They're called morticians. Um, you know, what's your day like? What's your ideal day? Um, a really good way to kind of figure out as a young person where you might go in life is to shadow a few professions. If you thought about being a firefighter, I mean, go hang out at the fire station for a couple of days versus having gone to firefighting school, becoming a firefighter, you get on the job and you find out it's not for you. Uh, go shadow a couple things and learn what this feels like, because the rhythm of life is what you're going to get no matter you know, what slot you choose in life. So you might as well figure out what that rhythm is and if it's your rhythm. And the last chapter in volume one is, I think, my favorite. It's called Doing Action. And Theodore Roosevelt had a, had a great quote, as, as he often did, even though, all right, yeah, he was a statist in, in some sense and all that. But you've got to consider the man you know, from his times also. But no one would argue that uh, he wasn't truly a man of action. And the quote I like is this. Get action. Do things. Be sane. Don't flitter away your time. Create. Act. Take a place wherever you are and be someone. You know, get action. What a quirky way to say it. You know, I'm kind of out of action. I need to go get some action. You know, I think of action as a doing thing. Go, go act. But uh, he, he forms it as a noun, which, which I think is very interesting. So that's an outline of the book. The, the volumes two and three get into more practical stuff. As you can see, the, the groundwork is sort of laid inside the person in volume one. Volume two, teaching, deciding, prioritizing, solving, how to solve problems. There's a way to do this. Power. What to do with power. Everybody has power over someone else, even if it's a street bum has power over someone else if they recognize it. You know, uh, 
guy asks for a quarter, nah, nah, I don't want to give you a quarter. And uh, if he starts screaming, don't hit me, don't hit me, all right, he's got power over you, according to the rest of the audience. They'll, they'll turn and think you're beating up this guy on the street, okay? This is a guy with no money whatsoever, a stranger until a minute ago. Everyone can have power over someone else. And uh, power is not necessarily evil or unethical uh, everywhere you go. And, and I analyzed Schopenhauer's uh, The Art of Controversy. Anybody read that? 38 Principles. Uh, um, yeah, very interesting stuff. So I think there are ways to have power over people that are ethical, and there are ways that are not. So I talk about that. Um, leading, leadership, working in success, savings and debt, money and inflation, taxes, government, fighting. Um, I don't call it self-defense, I call it fighting. You know, someone else started a fight, um, you know, hopefully if I've done my job, I'm going to win the fight. Volume three, eating, eating well. I mean, every bite of food you eat is making a new you somewhere. So, you know, is that 99 cent Burger King Whopper really such a bargain? You know, have you, have you saved up the $7 in, in negative health effects it's going to have, you know, months or years down the road? Health, moving. What I mean moving is locomoting yourself on the planet, whether it's walking around or flying airplanes or everything in between. Uh, surviving. Then uh, some good stuff here. Pursuing a woman, loving a woman, husbanding, fathering. Believing in a spiritual sense, how to know God. Suffering and then uh, living. So those are the 35 chapters of, of the three volumes. You can get an idea of kind of where I'm trying to go here. Now... Having been in this freedom thing since 92, it's actually 22 years this month, my first book came out. Uh, when it came out, Bo Greitz was an independent candidate in the 92 elections. Remember Bo Greitz? Clinton had just gotten elected. I mean, this seems a long time ago. We've had a few presidents since then. Uh, there was no internet back then, certainly no Bitcoin. Um, a lot has happened, but some things are, are still the same. Some, some things lacking in us uh, are still there. So I'm trying to get, not so much in the, in the philosophical or the political refinement of things, because other people are doing that very well. I'm trying to refine myself. And as I do that, maybe I can help you refine yourself also. One author's talking about there's four kinds of people. Which one are you? There's the cop-outs, the hold-outs, the drop-outs, and the all-outs. The cop-outs have no goals. The holdouts have goals, but never with commitment. The dropouts have goals, but with lost commitment. The all-outs set goals, commit, pay the price to win. And we all vary in that because we're human and you know, we can't all be all-outs all the time. But uh, it's, it's hard to argue with, with those four categories you know, in any kind of subject. What I'd, what I'd like for the, the fellows here, especially the younger guys, to take away from a talk like this is basically stop existing as a boy, okay? Just because someone is a male and just someone is, is you know, 25 or 30 or 40 or something like that does not make you a man, okay? You're only a man if you can cope with the world at large in a, in a general and victorious sense, no matter what the world throws at you. If you're a male and you have to call for another male to help you out of something, you're, you're still lacking something, whether it's to fix your car, or you call the cops to defend you, or you know, you've got kind of an emotional issue that is a simple one, but you just haven't really like, you know, gelled as, as a man, and, and you know, you're just floundering in something. You've got to call someone. There's nothing wrong with calling people, but you know, there, there's a lot of ungelled fellas out there, and it's going to make a difference, especially if they want to marry and have families, okay? Because you, you can't give what you don't have. And if you want to get married and have a family, you better really be on your game as a man, okay? If you have any doubts about that, wait, you know? I, I had immaturities in me in my 30s, and you know, I knew I would make a woman uh, you know, modestly uh, unhappy here and there. And so I, I didn't want to get married and cause the woman I loved to deal with someone who's still, still immature. So, uh, you know, this, I'm, I'm not holding myself out as some exemplar of, you know, the mature man. I'm, I'm growing every day like anyone else. But a man needs to be able to cope. And where the origin of this book came from is I'm going to read something from Jeff Cooper. Anybody know who Jeff Cooper uh, was? Founder of uh, Gunsight Training Academy. Um, before 
he did that in Arizona in the 70s, there wasn't a civilian academy to go to to learn how to properly shoot, especially with what's called the modern technique of, of handguns. And this is something Jeff and a few other uh, shooters back in the 50s and the 60s scientifically worked out. You know, before that, they had the, the Olympic style of, of shooting. You know, it would, it would be like, like this. You know, it's a, it's a silly way to shoot. And, uh, you know, people were uh, not winning their gunfights just because, uh, you know, they're not having their whole body, you know, used isometrically with themselves and so forth. So anyway, Jeff's uh, Gunsight Training Academy was the first one. A lot of shooters today and um, other uh, academies such as Front Sight, uh, Nash Piazza, he came from Gunsight as a student. Clint Smith was a range officer at, Thun uh, at, front, at uh, Gunsight. He's had Thunder Ranch for years and so forth. So. Cooper has, has had a, 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 an amazingly wide and deep effect in the tactical culture. But right before he died in 2006 in his uh, newsletter, I don't know if someone asked him the question or he just uh, came up with this as uh, something of his own interest. But uh, he's basically saying before, here we go. What should a young male of 21 know and what should he be able to do? There are no conclusive answers to those questions, but they're certainly worth asking. A young man should know how this country is run and how it got that way. He should know the Federalist Papers into Tocqueville, recent world history. Um, if he doesn't know what has been tried in the past, he cannot very well avoid those pitfalls as they come up again in the future. Uh, should be computer literate. Moreover, should know Hemingway from James Joyce, know how to drive a car well, such as not covered in driver's ed. He's talking about going to Bondurant school. You know, that's how to drive a car well. Should know how to fly a light airplane. Uh, and that was a that was a, a, a imp, that was a thorn in me as an absence. I wanted to be a pilot since I was a kid, and just never made it a goal. And finally, I you know I realized I've got the time, I've got the money, and I've always had the desire. And I just went out and did it. You know, two years ago, and so I racked up a lot of hours in in a couple of years and trying to catch up. And I have to thank Jeff for like you know should fly a light airplane. You know. <laughs> He should know how to shoot well, obviously. He should know elementary geography, both worldwide and local, have a cursory knowledge of both zoology and botany. He should know the fundamentals of agriculture and corporate economy, uh, well-qualified in armed combat, boxing, wrestling, judo, or its equivalent. He should know how to manage a motorcycle, be comfortable at least one foreign language, more if appropriate to his background. He should be familiar with remedial medicine. These things should be accomplished before a son leaves his father's household. Now, that's a tall order. Okay, I didn't get that. All right, yeah, yeah, he's looking with big wide eyes, like, wow. I can do four or five of those things, but the rest, wow. I mean, yeah, I felt the same way when I read some of this. They do not constitute a, quote, college education, which may or may not be a trade school. Um, you know, and that quote harkens back to uh, Heinlein's specialization is for insects. Yeah, you know, con a ship, change a diaper, deliver a eulogy, you know, et, et cetera. Um, not that, you know, we're going to be called to do all these things, but uh, you know, my, my sense of, of being a man is being able to shoulder whatever comes my way, especially if I'm going to have a family. And you know, anybody who, who feels themselves to be you know, a, a conscientious and responsible husband and their wife says, you, know, you always have to be right. You know, anybody have heard that? Any, any married guys here have heard that? You, know, you always have to be right. Now, a guy with, with a family, he's got the perfect retort. He said, yeah, honey, that, that's right. I, I always have to be right because I've got so much writing on me, I can't afford to be wrong for your sake. You know? And that's the way a responsible man should feel. He should glory in the weight of being a man, of being a productive human being that is growing, uh, helm, helmsmanship of his family. He should glory in that weight on his shoulders and want more. You know? Be a leader in his community and stretch himself. Every man really needs to live on his edge. And we've all got edges, you know, like this table. If you're safe back in the middle, and I know there's an edge, because you can see where he kind of drops off about a mile from there. Get right up to that edge, look over and scare yourself, all right? Face it. Once you do, guess what? That edge recedes, because you've conquered that piece of fear, and that edge recedes, meaning you've expanded yourself. I've, I've scared myself flying by pushing myself a little bit, you know, a crosswind component that was not in my comfort zone, but it's, it's going to be, 
you know, I'm going to get there. And, and, you know, fortunately, I haven't done, you know, haven't taken too big a bites. And so I'm, I'm here, I'm here to talk to you because otherwise, had I taken some big chances, you know, it, it's easy to, to bugger it, you know, in a small plane. Uh, but, but a guy really needs to find his edges, go there, face his fears so that they evaporate. He becomes bigger. He's going to have another itch somewhere else. You know, go there too. It's the only way to grow. And, you know, anything in life, if it's not growing, it's dying. There, there's no stagnation. There's no stasis. There's no neutral buoyancy. There's no staying put. You're either, you know, get busy living or get busy dying, as, as uh, Red said in Shawshank Redemption. So we've, we've got to be expanding ourselves. And to do that, you've, you've got to face some, some anxiety here and there. I think that was Bob Dylan, too, wasn't it? You think it was Bob who was the original one? It was, it, was, it was a line from one of his songs. Get busy living, get busy dying. Then Red quoted it. Cool. Um, to backtrack just a little bit, I, th I think it's very important as a man to know what your purpose is. Maybe less so as a woman. I think men are very purpose-driven. Someone uh, once wrote that for a man to feel good, he must first do good. And this is why it's so very, very socially painful uh, for large groups of men to be unemployed because they feel adrift. They're not contributing. They're not supporting themselves or their family. And it really eats at them differently than women, I think. Uh, I think women are different where they need to feel good before they do good. And you put those two together, and to me this says that a man really must love his woman first versus expecting the woman to love him first. She's the receiving vessel. She needs to be loved first, and then she'll magnify that and turn that back around and bless him with, with a greater love than he put in. Uh, but men have to take responsibility in that, in that sense. Yet again, responsibility in being a man. Love your woman first. Make her feel good first. Then she'll cheerfully do whatever you all have agreed is you know, her sphere of, of the household. Um, but, but a guy needs to find his purpose in order to plug himself into his destiny. Okay? Because we all have one, you know? And, and most likely, it's something you really love to do, but you've made excuses for why I can't do it, or it's too expensive, or the timing's not right, or what if people laugh at me, or what if I fail, and you know, what if, what if, what if, and I, I can get into some what ifs in this book. Uh, finding your purpose, even if you're middle-aged or old age, it's never too late. You know, it would have been best if you found it when you were 15, but you know. Uh, today will do too. It's like that phrase, when's the best time to plant a tree? You know, 30 years ago, when's the second best time? You know, today. Uh, finding your purpose is the same way. And there are a lot of deeper understandings into the human psychology that make that easier to discover for yourself. There's personality inventory tests like Myers-Briggs. I like that a lot. There's the Enneagrams and so forth. Getting a handle on kind of who you are and what makes you tick is really important. Otherwise, as a young man, you're going to be at the hub of a wagon wheel, and you've got all these spokes, which are your potential choices of career, destiny, uh, where you're going to live, and so forth. And before you embark down a spoke, you really need to know that it's pretty close to being the right one, if not the right one. Because if you go up this spoke, the farther you go, the farther away you are from its reciprocal spoke, right? If you have to like do a 180 and get, get back to there. So you've got to make the right decision as early as possible so you don't waste time. And finding your purpose, even if it's a belated discovery, is the quickest way to save time in your life. There are, there are people, probably more than 50% die doing stuff that they really rather wouldn't have done, okay? So therefore they married someone that, you know, was kind of different than who they really were and wanted and they lived someplace they didn't care for at the end of their lives. You know, people die with regret and there's no reason for it, you know? You've got to be introspective and be honest. Uh, someone recommended uh, Byron Katie's uh, The Work. Anybody heard of that? Yeah, and it's basically, I haven't done it yet, it's sort of a, a personal inventory kind of questionnaire. Um, and it looks very interesting, it looks very powerful, a, a tool to do it. So finding your purpose, you can't skip that step. A fella just cannot skip that step. Other ways of uh, self-improvement, I like Ben Franklin's The 13 Daily Virtues. Has everyone read the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin? It's a, it's a small book. You can find it at a used bookstore for a dollar. This is a guy at 17, pulled himself out of you know, a, a lowly uh, you know, upbringing, uh, lots of brothers and sisters, not much opportunity for him, raised himself up by his own bootstraps 
in a very concerted, scientific, determined way. And once he got to become an adult and was successful as a printer and then a politician and a scientist and all that, uh, I think he was still using his program where he would grade himself daily on his industry, his frugality, his temperance, his silence. Wow. His order, resolution, sincerity, justice, moderation, cleanliness, tranquility, chastity, and humility. And he wanted to you know, have a goal of, of not slipping in these areas, and he, and he, and he took account of it, just like a, like a tennis star would measure his, you know, his serve percentages or something. If I could give a young guy, I think, the best piece of advice, and, and you all not going to like it, of you know, where do I find time to do the things you know, that Jeff Cooper said you ought to learn how to do and all this? How do I find time to increase my skill set and all that? Stop all this video entertainment, all this screen time. You know, I read there are people you know, watching you know, stuff or Xbox or Wii or whatever. I don't even know all the stuff. 1,000 hours a year. That's a part-time job because a full-time job is 2,000 hours a year. You know, 1,000 hours a year times five years 5,000 hours? I mean, you could be a surgeon, you know, practically in that time. You could, you know, what you can do with an hour a day if you, if you, if you gave a damn. I put this in the introduction because someone said, well, you know, not everyone can fly a small airplane. Not everyone can travel. Not everyone can learn this. And I yeah, say, so, well, that's true. But, you know, what can you do? Yeah, you know, what can you do where you are right now? By the 12th grade, a boy has spent 8,000 hours in the classroom and 12,000 hours in front of video screens. Okay? Dump the video crap, start learning real stuff. I know the video thing is very alluring and it's getting more alluring still. Man, it'll be 3D and they'll jack it into your head within 10 years and, and you know, you're, you're going to be screwed if you go that route because you know, it has to be like a drug, like a serotonin pump you know, going on. You're, you'll never get out of that if you go there. Uh, you've got one life here and this one isn't a dress rehearsal. Okay. This is the real deal, at least in this uh, dimension. Acquire actual skills which can fulfill your purpose, make you money, help people, and thrill women. I mean, isn't that what guys want? In less than six hours a week in a year, you'll achieve any one of these. And I'm writing this to a high schooler, okay? Speak an entirely new language credibly well. Um, the four-hour work week guy, Timothy Ferris, he's got videos on learning a language pretty quickly. And uh, I speak Spanish and German, and his Spanish and German uh, seem pretty good. I listened to his, uh, his uh, little paragraph. You could own basic and reflexive skills in a solid martial art, okay? Also free to do. Um, become a confident dancer, ballroom, swing, you know, whatever. You can learn to fly a small airplane and become a private pilot. That takes about uh, eight to $10,000. You can spread it out over a year. If you want to learn how to fly, I recommend a quicker tempo because you're going to forget less. You're just going to keep going and not have to rebuild. Learn actual skills which are useful, self-enlarging, manly, and even lucrative. Uh, stop buying stuff and paying for transitory entertainment, you know, especially on credit. You should uh, learn what is important, insist on top quality, pay cash, buy the best, take delivery. Very important point. Lose the fat. Lose the pink jello. Get, you know, find some muscle underneath because being fit has, has paybacks everywhere. And if you go through life as a shuffling, you know, fat lump, man, do you, I mean, you know, your sex drive is bad. Uh, you, you don't get out in the sunshine. You, there's many things you physically can't do. It's like, wow, eat well, exercise, and, uh, I mean, honor yourself as a human being, as a man, you know. Why, 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 why wear that particular earth suit when you can change it and have a studly one? Find people of action and goals and integrity and associate only with them. This is why we're all here, okay? Because we care about stuff that matters and we're trying to do things that have an effect, that make a difference. Be boosted by human quality, and we've been doing that all weekend. Go home and do the same, although it's hard to find people of quality. Courage is also a muscle. Exercise it daily in these spheres. Courage is very multifaceted. There's a social courage, there's a financial courage, there's a physical courage, there's a moral courage. You know, find out where you're weak and start to, you know, exercise that. Become courageous because, uh, you know, our, our, our women expect that of us, I think. I mean, ladies, wouldn't you like your man to be, yeah, my, my guy's a badass. He's brave. He's courageous. He won't back down, you know, on something that, that he knows is wrong. Uh, that's not in it, all of us to the same degree. 
Face your fears, live your dreams, but you've got to learn what those are. So in closing, I would, I would recommend highly not putting the cart before the horse. And the cart is, is uh, philosophy and politics behind who you are. Okay, if we sloughed off tyranny, right, some way, somehow, what's the point if at the end we're just ruled by the boy we have remained? So man up, do the right thing, and uh, let's see you next year with some good successful stories. Thank you all. Do we have a moment for uh, some Q&A? A couple? Uh, yeah. All right. He'll pass the mic to anybody with a question. Any, any comment or uh, question someone might have about this? Yes, Angela. Hey, I'm sure you covered this, but why is it gender specific? Those are all traits I want to have. Those right. are all traits my old man told me I better have if I yep. wanted to make something of myself. Right. So, but no, but there's a great list of stuff. I just... I think it applies for all of us, though, doesn't it? it? It does. I think the entire package of what I'm saying probably seems more, you know, in a masculine sense. You know, uh, I, I don't want women in physical combat, and I, don't think, I think most of them want to go there, too. So, but, yeah, you're right. These are all human traits. But I think the whole package of what I'm talking about is inherently a, a manly thing. So that's my shtick. Anybody else? Any comments or other questions? Yeah. There seems to be an impression that uh, uh, over, over the last number of decades, I think going, maybe going back in, into uh, the 1950s, in popular entertainment, there has been a large extent uh, a kind of thing, kind of a thing of disapproval about what, what you were talking about, manliness and this sort of thing. What yeah. do you think is behind this? I think um, there are some clever people that write uh, some very clever stuff. If you've noticed TV shows, they're denigrating the husband, they're denigrating the father. You know, Al Bundy, the guy's a dumb shit, or he's an oaf or something like that. Uh, a snappy woman rules the household, and he's, yes, dear, kind of thing like that. Of course, there are households like that, but there's not even accidentally a show about, uh, you know, a, a guy that just stands up for, for being himself, who's not embarrassed by his testosterone. Jesse Stone, uh, Probably the exception. Anybody seen the Jesse Stone uh, series? Tom Selleck. He's a uh, uh, police chief in uh, Paradise, Massachusetts. And he's just this quiet, you know, get it done kind of guy. But uh, that's the only TV show I've seen. So I, I think there's been an assault on, on manhood because it encapsulates a lot of human qualities that are important. Not that, us, not that women can't have them too. But, uh, you know, if, if we want to get, get stuff done, we've got to be, you know, masculine about getting it done. Why, where are the men in this country that put up, you know, why do men put up with their wives being fondled at the airport, all right? Right, yeah. Exactly, right. So, you know, I'm... I'm Somebody said it. Yeah, yeah, you touch my wife like that, I'll clock your ass, you know? And make, make my wife cry? Are you kidding me? Man, there's a price for someone that makes my woman cry. You cry too, that's the price. So, um, I think there's been a concerted assault on these values and on manhood. Um, and that's a whole other subject, a whole other topic. Any other questions? Okay, we'll close it here so we can get to uh, Jeffrey's uh, final uh, closing thing. Thank you all for your attention. Good to see you. Thank you for watching this presentation. Visit Roberts and Roberts online at rrbi.co for all your precious metals needs. Roberts and Roberts not only accepts Bitcoin, they prefer it. If you enjoyed this video, also consider donating to Red Pill Productions.